What is ether? There's a lot of discussion about ether exists and ether doesn't exist and, and just what is it and, and uh, I dug into this question years ago and I got a pretty good definition that I think will satisfy everybody if they simply listen to it for a minute or two. So the question is what is ether? And a lot of people use this spelling which is ether, A-E-T-H-E-R. In my research, we found out that ether is undifferentiated ether. So this is more like the source uh, of where everything comes from. And ether is a differentiated form, which means it's, it occupies duality, it has motion. And it also occurs that there are, according to Keeley's research, countless forms and types of ether. All right, so let's give a little background on what matter and energy is because this is a type of energy and, and ether is more like energy. In the Walter Russell paradigm, he talks about there being nine or ten octaves to all matter in the universe, and he makes some beautiful tables to illustrate that. Uh, let's take it another step further and illustrate that there is a compass or an extent from energy to matter, which, is, which means uh, sensible physical matter that we can hold in our hands or hold in our <coughs> test tubes, as opposed to different uh, finer types of energy that we can't hold in our test tubes and we can't measure it, like mind force, for instance, or life force. In the Keeley paradigm, he has seven subdivisions that take in gross matter all the way to energy. And these are major subdivisions. They incrementally merge into each other in countless steps. So it's not just molecular and not just atomic, but they merge into each other. If you look at a, an atomic table today, today's world, you'll see that they list all the, the standard elements. But then you have another table, which you don't hardly ever see anymore, unless you go look for it. It's the table of the isotopes. And if you put those two tables together, you will see isotopes merging between different elements. So there's countless types of elements if we throw in the isotopes. And the basic things we need to know about this is, on the molecular level, this is like a brick. It's a gross compound molecular substance, a piece of sand, a rock, a piece of steel. They're all molecular in size because they, they're composed of atoms. Many different atoms make up molecules. When we go to the atomic level, or the atom level, we know that these are made out of electrons, protons, neutrons. And at this level, in the 1880s, the atom was considered to be indivisible. There were no subatomic particles acknowledged in the 1880s. That first came about officially in the official channels in 1893 when Rutherford um, designated the electron. So the electron in 1893 was the first subatomic or quantum particle identified by conventional science. Uh, they left out the fact that Keeley had been working in this quantum realm for 20 years prior to this. Another thing I did was I went back and I captured every definition of ether that I could find from the old science books and the old textbooks, and I found a lot. And the interesting thing was they all differed from each other. It did not seem to have two definitions that were the same, and all of these, I think I found over 100 different, either definitions or uses of that term. So what is it? Even in their terms, when that's what they were dealing with, they could identify atoms, but they couldn't identify the quantum world that made up the atoms. And since they didn't have any labels for it, no one had ever actually found one, they said, well, if it's, if it's not an atom and it's not a molecule, then it's ether. And they didn't have instrumentation to measure it in those days. So in that context, and that's the definition I use in SVP, all subatomic or quantum entities 
were what was being referred to as the ether because there are countless units of these etheric particles, this etheric energy, and they all behave in different ways. And that accounts for why we had so many different definitions. They were all looking at different animals and, and lumping it into the word ether because they didn't know how to analyze it and take it apart. Keeley, however, did. He was able to take molecular water, disassociate it into its hydrogen and oxygen atoms, disassociate those into photons, right over here, photons. Photons make up electrons, so we, so we got to the photon level, which was called luminiferous ether, because it was luminous and you couldn't really see it except for the illumination, but it did have other properties. And he disassociated that. He didn't call it a quark. This is a modern term. He called it the interetheric range of forces. And then he disassociated that and he got up to what he called the mind level. Compound interetheric is pure mind force. This is the life force, the mind force. The celestial radiation comes in at these levels. His various designs of his molecule were illustrating the triune nature of the forces. For instance, an electron, proton, neutron. And then there's different kinds of uh, quarks, which we know there's six different basic types of quarks. There's probably more. And that pretty much sums up what the ether is. Well, I drew this in 1986. And it's basically the Keeley's model. It's a, it's a redraw of a design that he had. And I included these three smaller aliquot parts in here so that I could understand better how it works. And these dark zones, are, you know, these are, sh these are etheric shells that spin around the outside of the atom. Today they call, today they call it the electron cloud. And it spins in three different planes. And so we got a plane here that's with over to here, so it's, they're in bands. We got another band here on the inside and another internal band here. So where they overlap, they seal the atom together. Now this is Keeley's morphology. <clears throat> and each one has got seven poles. We've got a pole in the center and six on the outside. And each one of these is the same way. So you can see that if we, if we put the Russell wave function onto this, it becomes very complicated very quickly. There's infinite energy in here, and understanding that wave function will allow us to release this energy in a safe, benign way.